Hey, it's David Thomas from Orchard Hills Church here in Noonan. My father, Dr. Stacy Thomas, is going to be delivering the sermon today. Today, you know, for, actually for the past couple weeks, he's been talking about living Christ's life. And so today we're going to kind of continue that. And so many times in life, you know, we're told in the Bible, we have to live for the things to come, focus on the things above. But we have things we have to deal with here. You know, we go to church, we get filled up, we get on fire, we get motivated, we go home and a couple days into our week, all that's forgotten. And then we start feeling guilty that we're not doing the things that we need to do. It seems like this vicious cycle that we just can't seem to get ahead. How do we get ahead? How do we focus on the things to come and live the life God wants us to live? Stay tuned. You're going to get a lot of value out of it. Amen. He's worthy of our praise. We build our life on the truth of his word, who he says he is and who he says we are in him. Let's sing this. Worthy of every song.
Praise the Lord in this place. Come on, somebody. Give him praise. Amen. Thank you, Joe and Kim. Why don't you take your Bibles and turn to one verse. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17. While you're turning there, some of those people that were in here earlier as we were showing some slides on the screen are interested that uh, I'm preaching on the be- about the Beatles today. Well, I am. And I'm going to show you a little bit about that. Not George, Paul, uh, and um, uh, Ringo, and I can't think of the other one, but another kind of Beatle. So you're going to be, I think, excited about this, or at least interested, so don't go anywhere. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love. Rooted and grounded in love. In love. Now, we've been preaching for two weeks. This will be our third week on Christ's life. And I hope by now you're con- starting to get a picture of what it means to live that life. Quick review. Where is Christ now? He's at the right hand of the Father. What is he doing? Subjugating, subjugating all enemies to his kingdom, to himself. In that process of doing that, we are co-laborers, co-heirs, and we're working with him in this process. The father asked Jesus to ask him for the nations of which he had planned before to give him in Psalms 2.8. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. Now, why don't we ask God for things? Well, we feel too bad about the mistakes we've made. We feel too bad about the things that we've done that have let him down. We feel too bad about the things that have let ourselves down. We don't feel we're worthy or that we in any way uh, justify receiving goodness from God. And so we limit our prayers, we limit our life, and we live a half-life. We live between Calvary and Pentecost, as we've been talking about in this session. But the question is, What has God done through his son and is now doing in his son that is causing me to live that life? We have been crucified with Christ. We saw that. We have just as much been sentenced as Jesus Christ was. We are worthy of death. And in him we have co-died with him, Galatians 2.22, but him himself, Jesus, paying the price and not us. But that was not the end of it. We've been risen with Christ. Therefore, we share his life. We share his victories. We share the inheritance and power that he has been granted resurrection power from the grave. Now, Christ interceding for us knows how we feel, knows our mistakes, and he pleads to the Father for strength, wisdom, patience, and anything that we might need to live this life victoriously. But we're not. The Holy Spirit intercedes for us when it hurts too bad for words and we can't even articulate or enunciate what we feel. And we wonder if anybody else in the world it can even identify with the way we're feeling. The Holy Spirit has it. He has already custom made the desires and will of God with the present predicament that you're in. He articulates this in groaning to the Father and You may not even understand how you feel and how you're praying, but it gets to the Father exactly the way it's supposed to. And so we learned about the hope in that. And then we went on to see Paul's example of somebody who does this. He's somebody that changed the Jewish religion from a sect into a Gentile religion in one century. We learned how he Uh, so spread the gospel to the Greeks that the Bible was written down in the Greek. He evangelized Achaia and Asia, Galatia, Macedonia. We're talking about pretty much the known part of the world during that day. We, We saw what was Paul's secret. He put no confidence in the flesh. His total sufficiency was from Christ. But you know, I got to reading about all this and studying this, and I said, yeah, that's true. I know it's true, but I can't get it in me 
to make it really work, what is the problem? Well, this week, God gave me an opportunity to live that. I've, and we're going to see this up on the screen. I want to talk to you about the pine beetle. And are you ready on the screen uh, to go with the first picture? Can you do that for me? Let's do the first one. Uh, I don't know what that one is. Uh, yeah, okay. I see it in the back now. There is a tree right there on my land. I have a little small farm. And you can see the devastation of the greenery there behind. And there is a tree that they have taken down. Now, it, the needles are not gone yet. So they've almost finished with that tree. And then the needles are going to fall off. Let's go to the second one. I want you to look at the pine beetle. That pine beetle starts out as that little bitty lava, that little bitty seed that's planted in the bark of your tree. And then it grows to be that gross little beetle bug that you see. I found one that was dead in the tree, and I thought there's no way this big, ugly, gross, monstrous-looking thing could be a beetle. But I took it and tried to scare my wife with it, and then I threw it in the trash can. And then I saw a picture of this, and I thought, wow, I had one of those in my hand. I couldn't believe it was that big. That's what a pine beetle is. Now, it's devastating profit, property across Georgia, destroying thousands and perhaps hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of dollars worth of pines. And there's an analogy here that I want you to see with the way the devil works in our lives that keeps us from being filled with the Spirit. Let's go to the next one. There it is, that little lava the seed is in, and it's planted in the bark of the tree. It kills the tree because it cements the crevices and it doesn't allow for the water and the nutrients to get inside the tree and so it basically suffocates the tree. Next. You can see how many pines it's taken down on my place and it has just wiped them out like an army of Egyptian uh, locusts. It is just moving across from one pine to the next pine. Now, I had the forestry come out. I was bush hogging back there, and I discovered that. I said, goodness gracious, all my trees are dead. What happened? I called him out. He said, yeah, that's, that's the pine beetle, all right. And he showed me one where they're active in. He showed me other. I said, what causes this? He said, stress trees. They <laughs> almost wanted to laugh. Stress trees? What are they thinking about? I mean, you know, paying their mortgages? I mean, what do you mean, stress trees? And he goes, well, they don't have adequate root systems because they're either too close or for some other reason, they don't have a root system that is sufficient to make them powerful enough to stand off these invaders. I thought, man, that's incredible. A root system and that these beetles know and identify which tree they go after it and then they kill it. Let's go to the next slide. There's how they plant that lava. You can see them in the, just all over the bark. That's a tree I cut down. It's laying in the grass. And you can see the different places where the seeds have been planted. Suffocating the possibility of water to get in those uh, needed spots. Next. Once they get in, they tunnel through the tree inside these little baby beetles and they destroy it from the inside by making all these inroads into this precious tree, and it's done. Thank you. All right. With that illustration, I want to ask ourselves, what is it about Paul's life? Well, before I do that, let's finish with the beetles. The beetle attacks the weakest tree with the smallest root system. Stressed, easier to get through the tree somehow. Now, I don't know how all that works, but that's how it is. Now, when you think about the fact that we just read that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love. I don't think we really get that. You know what? 
Paul got it. Man, did he ever get it. He'd been living his whole life with regulations. The Mosaic Law, 613 commandments that he rigorously kept, he said, all his life up until the point that he met Christ, he had been sure that he'd been doing enough to satisfy God. But how much is enough? It's every day this legalistic process of working through this. And he was going to the, not only was he doing it the wrong way, he was going to the wrong places, going to the synagogue, going to the temple, trying to earn the favor of Almighty God, making sure that he was pleasing God in every single way. And then on the Damascus Road in Acts 26, he met the real Savior. And Jesus said to him, why are you persecuting me, Paul, or Saul? He said, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. Well, in Paul's mind, it's impossible for Jesus to be the Messiah because the Bible says in Deuteronomy, cursed is any man that hangs upon a tree. It's an impossibility for the, I can't bring these two together, a cursed man and a holy Messiah, a victorious Messiah. Those two just don't work. I get the righteousness of this Jesus Christ. I get the fact that he was healing people so-called. I get all of that, and I like it. But he was crucified. That totally limits him from being a candidate for the Messiah. But when he saw Jesus high and lifted up, God gave to him something in that moment and in those next three years that changed the world. Now, I want to go to the next thing. Those beetles lay eggs in the crevices of that bark of the tree, preventing nourishment from rain, minerals, and the things that it needs. Well, what are the devil's seeds? What does he lay in our hearts and minds? Poisonous seeds that come to fruition that keep us from getting where Paul got. Now, the devil always destroys what's good. What does he say in first? I mean, in John ten ten, the de the thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill, and destroy. I am come that they might have life, and they might have it more abundantly. Now he comes to kill anything good. I, I you know, you walk into a nursery. I used to l love to do that back when we had the school and everything. They had all the the little kids back there. I used to come and just kind of stare in the door of those two year olds, and just watch how they operate. I mean, it was incredible to me. It was just how they just bop over to some kid, and he bops him on the head, and one of them comes over there, and he grabs his bear, and the other one's loving on this other one. I mean, you can learn a whole lot from watching those kids. I mean, it was fun. But you know, the devil's already planning how to destroy each one of those. Jesus said, suffer the little children to come unto me, for such is the kingdom of God. He's already got plans to destroy your children, your grandchildren, and your great-grandchildren. Because he loves what's good, destroyed, it brings him happiness because he himself knows his destiny. Misery loves company. Now, if you don't think it's important for you to le learn to walk in the Spirit and teach your children to walk in the Spirit then you're missing something very important. You say, well, I give him Sunday and the rest of the week is mine. Well, God help you. Because he not only wants Sunday, he wants to liberate you to enjoy him every day of the week that you couldn't even fathom living without enjoying Jesus seven days a week. You couldn't do it. Now, this tunneling through the pine tree, I think is analogous to the fact that he puts these thoughts in our head. And these thoughts that go down into our head of you're not good enough or you'll never get the Christian life right, that's just for preachers and that's for all these other people, and you just do the best you can. After all, you know the deacon that lives down the street and you see the way he lives, you see what he does. Man, you're doing better than him, so don't worry about it. I mean, that's what people tell me. Now, Let's put this in perspective and let's bring it all together. Now, the devil goes after the weakest prey. Well, what makes somebody strong in Christ? What makes him really powerful in Christ? 1 John 2, 14. 
I have written unto you fathers because you know him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you young men because you are strong and the word of God abides in you. What does he tell us in 2 Corinthians 10, 4? For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Now, those strongholds are the thoughts that the devil puts in your mind. He plants seeds that you've not been done right in life. He plants seeds that you need this or you've got to have this. He plants those seeds that you'll never be able to forgive this other person of what they've done for you. He plants incredible seeds that if not if they're not taken down, you know, if I would have cut down the first tree, that forestry guy told me, he said, if you would have found the first tree those beetles were in, and you would have cut that tree down to the ground, and you would have dragged it off over here, and you would have burned it into a cent, and it just been cinders, you'd have stopped your problem. But you're too late. You've got a whole forest now that's been eating, and it's going to be very difficult to stop it now. That's our problem. Uh, we live with those thoughts, those erroneous inroads into our tree for so long that we're so used to thinking wrongly that we, we've, we've put up an impediment, a wall to being filled with the Spirit. Now, the Word of God is the remedy for this. But that's, we're not finished yet. It, we, we've got a long way to go here, so just hang on. The Word of God, uh, Hebrews 4.12, For the Word of God is quick and alive, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Well, Paul had the entire Old Testament. Why didn't he have Christ? I mean, he'd kept the whole thing. Nobody in the uh, New Testament had the New Testament yet. It had yet to be written. Didn't get started until about uh, 15 years after Jesus died. So they were all looking to the Old Testament as the Word of God, and that was the only word they had except for the life and example of Jesus and the oral testimony that was coming on. So, what is the problem, Paul? Why can't you get it together if you've got the same word everybody else? Missing something very, very important. Now, the Word of God is powerful. And the Word of God is your protection. And the Word of God, if it doesn't line up with the Word of God, you pull it down. You get rid of it. You throw it overboard. You cast it away. You do what's ever necessary in order to remove any thought that doesn't line up with the Word of God. Because that's just one seed. You say, well, the devil can't put seeds in my mind. <laughs> really? Check out the Bible. Uh, Judas, he put in Judas's mind to betray Jesus. It's right there in John. So he has the power to do that. But we have the power to defend ourselves against him. The Bible says that the word of God is a hammer, a fire, a rock, a light, a mirror, a food, milk. It's the word of life. It's a seed. It's living water. It's a sword. All of those things, metaphors, analogies of what the word does, a hammer, it crushes sin, a fire, it burns within us, it's a, it's a rock, something for us to stand on in life, it's a light, it gives us direction, it's a mirror, it shows us what we really are, it's food, it gives us nourishment in order to live, it's milk, it brings us up, it strengthens us, the word of life, not death. It's a seed, it grows, and it brings. If you plant it now as a little seed, it'll grow and grow and grow and grow. It's living water, it's a sword, it divides asunder. That's what the Word of God does. Now, but if you just have the Word, and you don't have what Paul had, I doubt you're really going to be filled with the Spirit. I doubt you're really going to be free. Because he learned something very very, very important. Now, what was Paul's secret? Here it is. Paul was liberated from laws, ceremonies, customs, habits, do this, do that, legalism of a thousand different kinds that had been planted in his mind about how to please God until he finally, on that road, met the God of grace. 
the God of love, who loves Paul no matter what he's done, where he's been, willing to forgive him and set him right with him for the rest of his life. Loving Paul, not based on behavior. You see, Paul knew that God alone does great wonders. Paul knew that God created the world out of nothing. G Paul knew that God can bring life from death, but Paul did not know that he could justify the ungodly. And Jesus taught him that. He taught him about what he was given him that was apart from works, nothing to do with works, Nothing to do with circumcision. Nothing to do with going to the temple and paying your tax. Nothing to do with keeping the Sabbath and all of those different rules. Nothing to do with any of that. One simple thing. Faith alone, Paul. Believe in me and what I've done for you. When he got a hold of that. Oh boy. I mean you're talking about somebody in prison that was set free for the first time in their life. God in heaven loves me no matter what. He has saved me by the fact that I have trusted in him and he just loves me. He died for me. He bled for me. And then he could see the suffering Messiah. Then he could see the glorified Messiah to come. He could see all of that through different lenses because he was looking through the glasses of love of a Jesus that died for him, lived for him, living for him, and coming back for him. Now, when I got to thinking about that for myself, I said, you know, you've been preaching for a long time. You've been doing all this for a long time. Do you really... Really? Aren't you still trying to work and, and, and do all of this and to please God through what you do? Get up, pray, read your Bible, all those kind of things. Are you, do you ever really just realize that Jesus loves you? Now, I want you to get a hold of something. Love alone is the most powerful incentive for doing the will of God than legal regulations and the fear of judgment ever could be. Being afraid of what God's going to do you, that's not a strong enough power to get you filled with the Spirit. Being a, trying to do what's right and keep the law, you won't do it. What did Paul say? He said, the Paul's not bad, but the flesh is the problem, and you'll never do it. The, the law is simply a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ and to bring us into his power, into his love, and to what he's accomplished. You'll never do it in yourself. He discovered a living God, a talking God, a powerful God that loved him to the point that he could be free to share it. Free to tell anybody that Jesus loves him. And you know, he could even go further than that. He could say, you Gentiles that I've hated my entire lives, called you dogs, you too can be saved on the same platform I am apart from the law. You can have it. And you see, huh. in fact, let me tell you something. This, I, it, this is really incredible. If you study the life of Paul, this is what you'll realize. He would have to lower himself just to keep the commandments of Moses. Jesus said, the rich young man, on, on what is the greatest commandment? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbors yourself. Upon this, all the law and the prophets are founded. All the law on that golden rule. The moral interpretation of that is that God rises to a higher place than all of that law, and he simplifies it in two commandments. One commandment, really, with two phrases. Paul said, why would I lower my standard to go after that law when I am liberated to keep this law? All I've got to do is love him back. All I've got to do is receive his love. All I've got to do is feel accepted and loved for the first time in my entire life. And that compelling power was stronger than anything he'd ever con conceived of in life. It was pulling him. It was drawing him. 
I'm going to tell you something. When you're compelled by Jesus' love alone, empowered by the Holy Spirit alone, to do the will of God out of simple, pure gratitude alone, you cannot be stopped. I'll say that again. Compelled by Jesus' love alone. Not because you kept all the things in your primary book. Not because you're pleasing somebody or somebody over there in your family or somebody in the church and you feel pretty good about yourself or you've read through the, the word. I'm not saying you shouldn't do that. I just told you, you need that. You have to have it. But if you're doing that out of a sense of legalism, you're never going to get to that place of being totally free to be filled with the Spirit. Paul breathed in the Word of God because he was breathing in the love of God. Every breath, breathing in love, breathing out love. It was taken in the Word of God because in that Word was just sentences and sentences and sentences and paragraphs of God showing him how much he loved him. And the more he read, the more he received the love and the more he gave the love. He couldn't get enough. And you see, uh, the power that's there Available for us. Paul grasped it. In fact, we're in Ephesians. Turn back. And those that were in the Bible study in Ephesians, it took us a year to get through this book, but it was worth it because there's about three verses here that say everything that you need to know about where you should be. Chapter 1, verse 17. And the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. What did I tell you that the last sermon about the system of, of praying and, and having a little, having a little regimen of, of how to stay filled with the Spirit? The first one is when, when you get up, you praise God. Second one, you pray for illumination as you read the Word of God. That's exactly what this verse is. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. The Holy Spirit wrote the Bible, and the Holy Spirit can tell you what it says and show you how to apply that to your life. Now, why? That the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. Everything that he's planned for you, every door that you will open, Every call you'll ever make, every person you'll ever meet, the hope of his calling, rising you up to where God wants you to be. The wonderful thing about God is he never leaves you where you are. He saw Peter as a cursing fisherman, but he also saw the rock of the church, and he made him that. That's what he sees you as. He sees you as everything he wants you to be, and the hope of his calling is emblazoned upon you it is as it were engraved upon your heart and God will not stop until he gets you there what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints he says Stacy everything I want on that cross and the resurrection I want you to have resurrection power I want you to have it I want you to understand it. I want you to walk in it. I want you to bask in it. I want you to stand for me. I want you to preach in it. But then he says this one. This is my favorite. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe? According to the working of his mighty power. But he couldn't do it much in, um, when he came back to Nazareth. Could he? Capernaum, why? Because they didn't have much faith. They limited God. It's possible to limit God. Your unbelief limiting him that you could see his mighty power in your life. When you, Paul, got a hold of what was available to him through the love of Christ, God said, I didn't just love you and forgive you of your sins. No, that was just the start of it, Paul. I loved you enough to raise you in resurrection power. You've been raised with me, Paul. 
And I'm going to give you what I have received. And I'm going to teach you what I know. And I'm going to send you to the places I've been. And you're going to accomplish what I want you to accomplish through me. In you. And so, Paul got a hold of that. Every day he couldn't wait to get up. Because he knew God loved him so much. Oh, he looked for <laughs> opportunities to share that love in a way. He just wanted to pour that love out. And he, man, I've been freed. I've been set out of jail. And I just want to tell you how to get out. You know, the prodigal son is a great example of this. And we don't, you don't need to turn there. But Luke 15, 11 through 32. Think about that boy that went out there and wasted his inheritance. Went out there, prostitutes and all this kind of stuff. And then he was finally eating the husk that you feed the swine. Stinking. I know. Because my daddy had about 122 pigs that my brother and I used to feed on a regular basis. And those are nasty animals. They get into that dirt, and I, they get into that slop, and we used to have to f take a tire with a 100-gallon barrel and burn that and boil it back when you still could, and then we'd let it cool down, and we'd pour that down in that slop, and I'm going to tell you something. It was a ooey-gooey mess. So here he is doing all that stuff, and his daddy's been out there every single day looking to see if he's coming back. And then over the horizon comes this tattered, stinking young man that used to be his son. So what happens? <laughs> he comes and he tells him, Daddy, I'm no more worthy to be your son. Just make me as one of the hired servants. I'll eat what they eat. I'll sleep where they sleep. I'll do what they do. Would you just give me a roof over my head? Because I'm not worthy to be called by your name. You know, you got to thinking about that. That man didn't say, well, let me think about that. Second chance, but you've got to prove yourself a little by little. That's a great idea about you being a servant, though. I like that. Show some humility. There's some promise there. And you know what? I, I don't find anywhere in the Bible. Ne God never does put repentant sinners on probation to see how they turn out. Not once through the entire Bible does he say you're on probation. I'm going to see how you turn out. And then we're going to see about giving you back what you lost. Wow. Wow. When I got a hold of that, I tell you what, I just started to weep. He doesn't put me on probation. When I fail him, he doesn't take me and lock me up and says, I'll let you out in two or three days when you've learned your lesson. He loves me all the way right where I am when I still smell like those stinking pigs. That's what he does. He said, I want to be a hired servant. He said, son. He said, I've sinned and no longer worthy. He said, bring a robe of righteousness. Cleansed by my blood. Put it on him. And he can wear it. I don't want to carry your name. I'm not worthy. Bring that ring of authority. He can go and represent me wherever he goes because that's the emblem of my name and my power and all that I am, you can still carry on, son. Tell you what, I'll just eat the servant's food. No, kill the fatted calf. All that I have is yours, boy. All that I have is yours. Wow. When we were at Florida, my little granddaughter... Chloe, she's, I think she's was three, maybe two, three. Anyway, I found her blanket, her little animal blanket. had a big monster on it. And I was cold sitting there watching television, and I pulled that up on me, and she comes up, and she stands there, and she just starts eyeballing me. I thought, hey, Chloe. She didn't, she didn't stop. She goes, 
It's not yours. It's not yours. It's mine. <laughs> Cutest thing. In fact, I, I, I've tormented her with that blanket the rest of the trip. I enjoyed it so much. But do you know God never says that? He never says it's not yours. It's not yours anymore. It's mine. He says, all I did for you, I came for you, I suffered for you, I died for you, I rose for you, I live for you, I intercede for you, and I'm coming back for you. That's how much I love you. When you get a hold of that, it'll change your life. You know the, um, the vineyard thing about the denarius, that's another you know, he said, if you work all day, back then a working day was 12 hours. If you work all day, you'll get a denarius. Will you do it? Yeah, yeah, I'll do it. People came on later on, two or three hours later. Hey, what is it? work all day, you get a denarius. Okay, I'll do it. Last person came, only had but one hour left, said, I'll work. And then when payday came and they started paying up everybody, uh, the one that worked all day got a denarius. The one that worked for six hours, nine hours got a denarius. The one for six hours got a denarius. And the one that worked for one hour got a denarius. And they said, man, this ain't not fair. <laughs> it's amazing that fair is not in God's Bible. He doesn't use the word fair. He uses just. But he's the one that is the just and the justifier of us. He bled and made us all just. But you know, when he does, when he did that, you know why he didn't give him a, how do you divide up a denarius? There's no, I can't divide up that denarius and chop it into a little piece of twelfth. Nor can God give you one twelfth of his love. That's what this was all about, showing God's magnanimous attitude towards us. That his love is total no matter what we have, where we are, and what we have to bring. You get all of God, all of his power, all of his love, all of his victory, all of his joy, all of his peace. You come to him and there is no twelfth, one twelfth. You get it all. He loves you all day long. Stop trying to please God. You've already pleased him in Christ. Just enjoy his love. Relish in his love. Because if you do that, you're going to do more for him than you've ever done before. Because you're going to be motivated by pure love. And you're not going to want to do anything because he loves you so much that is outside of the will of God. Praise God I had a dad that taught me that. When I was about four years old, I was a very destructive menace. And my dad, who was a truck driver who didn't have much money, we had a little on Pursley Drive. It's now right there where the Atlanta airport is, where the expressway is, and where those blinking lights that run across, there's where our little bitty house was. And dad had the porch terrazzoed, uh, that concrete porch, and oh. I'm sure it was pretty. But you know what this little Dennis the Menace did? He got him a little hammer. And he went out there, I did, and I chipped off every single edge. All the way off of that thing. I don't know why I did it. I just did it. I can still remember it. I can still remember seeing it and how it cracked. <laughs> I don't know why I was doing it. But I did it. And mom said, Daddy gets home, he's going to deal with you. I thought, oh, boy, I messed up now. She's not even, I'd, why don't you deal with me? <laughs> I'll take half now. But you know when he got home? He just looked at it. He said, Bubba, what would you do that for? I don't know what I said to him. But you know what he did? He picked me up. That big old 6'2", 240-pound man just picked me up and hugged me. When I was 13, he bought a brand new country squire. Mom used to let me drive from the mailbox to the carport in that brand new car 
and it had been raining, and my foot slipped off the brake, and I hit the gas right when we pulled in, and I was too freaked out. I thought that, that brakes weren't working, so I floored it. And when I did, we went almost through the wall. Broke the brick in, everything. Mom called. She says, Earl, you're going to need to come home. we got some problems. I, mean, I still see that little white uh, country squire, just that whole light, that whole quarter panel, everything just taken in. And he got in, said, I'm sorry, Daddy. I'm sorry my foot slipped off. He used to call me Bubba. And he said, okay, Bubba, don't you worry about it. He said, we can get a new car, but we can't get a new Bubba. And I, so many times, unconditional love. You know, when I think about that, and I think about God who died for us, and how many mistakes I've made in my life, and I've been so afraid to come to him, and yet he's waiting with his arms around me to forgive me and love me and to reinstate me. Does it mean there's no consequences to my mistakes? No, I'm sure there's a reaping and sowing effect. But he mitigates them with mercy. And so... To be filled with the Spirit, you can't be looking over your shoulder trying to please God and afraid He's going to swat you. You've got to really enjoy the fact that you've been liberated in love and you receive that in love and you want to give that away in love. I really believe that's the secret. Because then you realize what happened to you at the crucifixion, what happened to you at the resurrection. And what you're living with day by day, he just wakes you up saying, I love you, Bubba. I love you. Get up. Let's go. I'm going to show you how much I love you today, and I want you to tell everybody else how much I love them. Do we really believe that? Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. That every person in this building and every person watching can be liberated by love. By the love of Jesus alone that accepts us, loves us, has already justified us, ransomed us, redeemed us, in the process of sanctifying us, glorified us as a done deal already. Thank you, God, for all those things. May we live to know your love in a way that you've prayed we will. That we can know the love of God that passes all understanding. The love of God that we cannot be separated from with peril or disaster or destruction or whatever happens. Nothing can separate us from your love. God, would you teach us how much you love us? We, would you introduce us into your love? Would you let us walk in the halls of your love? Let us live in your love. Somebody that's sitting alone in their house today, they're saying, man, I'm lonely. I live by myself. I don't know how God loves me. He wouldn't have left me in this position. God, would you just put your arms around them and just show them how much you love them? They're not alone. They cannot be alone. An impossibility to be alone. Father, show us how much you loved us to send your only begotten Son into this world. For little children to learn the love of Jesus. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Let us go out with love the love of Jesus Christ and change a world like Paul did with one message he loves you apart from the law he died for you apart from the law he kept it for you it's not something you can do but the Holy Spirit inside of you will give you the power to keep his law he'll make sure 
that you're sanctified and made into what he wants you to be. Oh, God, just show us. People that have failed you a hundred times, a thousand times, ten thousand times, as I have. God, I just want to know that I'm forgiven. Show them that, God. They'll come forward and say, God, just forgive me. Forgive me for my failures. And oh, Father, we can see you saying, bring the fatted calf. Bring the robe of my righteousness. Bring the ring of my authority. Put it on. And let us walk out so grateful that you gave us something we didn't deserve, that we can never be the same. We'll tell the story a billion times before we die of your infinite love because you love me enough to save me. Unworthy as I am, you did. Father, we give you all the glory and all the honor. If somebody's never been saved, let them just say this simple prayer. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me my sins. I believe you're the Son of God. I'm sorry for the things I've done. I repent. Take me to heaven when I die. And Father, we'll thank you for saving them. All glory and all honor to you, for it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Hey, thank you so much for tuning in today and watching. We hope you got a lot of value out of today's message. If you are watching online, please remember to like, comment, and share this post with others. If you'd like to support the church and give any gifts, tithes, or offerings, you can do that at paypal.com with the email books.ohbc at gmail.com. Once again, we thank you for tuning in. God bless you, and we'll see you soon.